Hi, and welcome back to our lessons about the Minoan civilization and the Minoan art. So last video, we talked a little bit about the Minoan civilization. We talked about Sir Arthur Evans, who discovered them. We talked about the island of Crete, where they live, and a little bit about how we are learning about them since we can't decipher their language and what we're learning about them through their art and through their architecture. So here's a continuation. We're starting on section four where we actually get to start talking about the Minoan artwork. So here it is. So, Minoan art was very much centered around the everyday lives of the Minoan people. And often the people who could afford to have the art commissioned were the higher classes of people. So we often see what the higher classes of people were doing. So the first thing I want to talk about is Minoan pottery. And this is kind of, this is the oldest. Um, type of Minoan pottery. Um, it was a little bit more geometric in style. It had more basic designs. You can still see the fish. It's a very stylized, organic, almost geometric types of patterns. We see these wavy lines, which kind of uh, remind us of the ocean. We also see a lot of motifs of um, plant life and animals and these grasses and leaves, sometimes with very delicate lines. And in the later work, we see a lot of these really organic, stylized kind of um, animals with very flowy lines. The line work is really different from what we see in a lot of other places. This particular vessel is actually carved out of stone and it's called the harvester vase. And this is from the very later Minoans. And there's a couple things that are really incredible about this vase. One of them is the amount of detail that is carved into this. And the next is the overlapping of the people because before what we tend to see is these not very realistic um, depictions of animals and of plant life, but we're getting into this figurative work where we're not seeing people laid out flat next to each other, but we're actually seeing depth in the carving and we see different people working and they're actually overlapping each other, which is a huge step forward as far as art goes and realism of art and, and working towards what we're later going to see in the archaic and classical Greece of getting to these realistic depictions of figures. Frescoes is the other main kind of art that we find from the Minoans. And a fresco is different from a painting in that in fresco, they would lay down the plaster and while the plaster was still wet, they would actually paint into the plaster. So what happens is that the paint sinks into the plaster, levels deep so that it really becomes a part of the wall rather than just being paint like on a canvas that is on top of the wall. It really becomes a part of the wall. And this is another example in this painting here where we see these splotches of where the original artwork was. And then we also see this background areas where Sir Arthur Evans and some of the artists that were working under him completed the painting the way that they thought it probably looked. So this is kind of a, a, a two-parted painting because it has the original and then it has the other artist's interpretation kind of on top of it. 
Now, what we're going to see with these Minoan frescoes is a huge focus on plants and animals. Um, and we see this really organic, flowing, almost Dr. Seuss-esque lines. Um, and Minoan frescoes and Minoan artwork has always been some of my personal favorite artwork throughout art history. We also see a lot of figures from the Minoan period. So this one on the right, the snake goddess, was actually always my very favorite, uh, was always my very favorite piece of artwork from art history. I just thought she was so interesting and beautiful. And she has a cat on her head and a snake in each of her hands. And we're not really sure if she's a goddess or a priestess, but she's made using a process that we called faience. And faience is a glazed earthenware. So it's a terracotta, kind of like this red clay, but these Minoans actually figured out how to glaze this pottery, which is not something that we're seeing in most of the world at this point. We do see a lot of this hand position in the Minoan figurines. And this one, I, I put these next to each other so you can see that she is obviously one of the much more advanced examples. And there were much more simplistic examples that existed. Not all of the artwork was quite this advanced. This is an extremely interesting piece that we see. And what we call it is the young god from Polycastro. And this young god, this, this sculpture here, it's about a foot and a half tall. So I mean, 12, 18 inches. So it's not very large. And it's what we now call chryselephantine. And anytime you hear someone talk about chryselephantine, we're talking about a sculpture that's made out of ivory and gold. So they tend to be very expensive sculptures. This particular one is made from hippo ivory that probably came imported from Africa or from Egypt because of how these people traveled and uh, and traded with other cultures. This particular man, we assume it was a young god. We're not sure. It also had serpentine and rock crystal, and it appears that he's been damaged, and most people believe that he was burned and intentionally vandalized, probably by someone who was conquering these people. But one of the things that we find really fantastic about this sculpture in particular, you can see, if you look at this detail of his hand, if you see the elegance of the hand and the accuracy there, where you can actually see the veins under the skin, that are carved into this tiny little hand. I mean, you think of him, he's hardly larger than a Barbie doll with this sort of detail carved into the hand. And we're not seeing this sort of realism or this sort of accuracy anywhere else in the world at this point in time. It's amazing. It's an absolutely incredible, incredible example of the level of artistic talent that we were actually seeing come out of the Minoan culture. Nature was another thing that really influenced the Minoans. And a few of these are examples of frescoes that we found um, both um, at Knossos, at the other palaces on Crete, and also this large image you're seeing here was another one of the images from Thera. So um, we've got this very stylized, very whimsical, organic interpretation of these plants here. And another thing that's really amazing about this is that these aren't 
this is an art to tell a story. We're not seeing a king defeating his enemies. We're not seeing soldiers. We're not even seeing a, a, a account of daily life. What we're seeing is purely art for the sake of art, for decoration, for beauty. And that's also something that we're not seeing in the rest of the world at this point in time. Most of the other places in the world at this point in time, we're seeing art that is telling a story that's conveying a message to people as opposed to just being art for the sake of art and beauty, which is what we're seeing in this Minoan culture. Another thing that we can see when we look at some of these Minoan frescoes is some of the influence from the Egyptian culture. We know that these Minoans traded with the Egyptians for a couple of reasons. The most important of which is that we find Minoan artwork inside of Egyptian tombs. So we can we can find that piece of artwork inside of an Egyptian tomb and we can compare it to the other Egyptian stuff and say, look, this piece doesn't fit. This was different, right? But then when we compare it to the Minoan artwork, we can pretty clearly see because of the style that it's a Minoan piece of artwork. And what's happening there, and because we know about the ships and that they were trading, is that they actually took this artwork to Egypt to trade it. What we're seeing in these images here is what we call a composite view, which is really popular in Egyptian artwork, and we're seeing it here. So what we see in both of these, this one here on the right is an Egyptian um, fresco, and we see the profile view. So we're seeing the side of their face, right, the profile view, but when you look at the eye, the eye is drawn from straight ahead. And this is not all that common in a lot of places except for Egypt. And so this is one of the ways that we see the influence of the Egyptian artwork manifesting itself in the Minoan artwork. I mentioned in the last video, but a lot of the Greeks, and it started here, and it moved throughout Greece, but we're seeing the difference between men and women, where the men are painted in this darker color, and women are painted in white. And we can, again, see her traditional dress with the layered skirt, with the flounces, and the exposed breasts. And this was just the way that they dressed back then. It shows that men wear, wore barely more than a loincloth. This is a warm part of the world. And this is in general how they dressed. But it's important to note that in a lot of Greek artwork, starting all the way at this time in the Minoans, we're seeing the men portrayed in this darker color and the women portrayed in the whiter color. So that's an important thing to note. So talking again about women's clothing, here's just a couple more examples of the women's clothing. And you can see, again, we're seeing these typical layered skirts, often in bright colors and with colorful patterns, and the exposed breasts. And that is just the way it was. And that's their style, which in most parts of the world would not be considered appropriate now but this was just the way that they dressed. So let's talk a little bit about the fall of the Minoans and what events ended up leading to the eventual demise of the Minoan situ civilization. Now, it's important to remember that all the time when we're talking about ancient history, a lot of what we think we know about ancient history isn't necessarily based in hard fact. It's about historians studying the artifacts that are found and coming up with theories. Now, the more historians agree with these theories, the more prominent they become. But until we have actual written accounts of what happened and we can decipher their language, we don't know for sure. But what I'm about to share with you is the generally accepted consensus of most historians. So I showed you this picture earlier about Akrotiri, which was on the island of Thera. 
Now, Sarah is a C-shaped island today, and you can go visit it. It's often called Santorini now. So Santorini is this C-shaped island, but it didn't always look that way. It used to be a full circle island. Now, around the year of 1628, there was a massive volcanic eruption. Now, this volcanic eruption, it is thought that this entire city that we are seeing here in the middle of this fresco simply imploded and sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Now, this is one of the reasons that people, a lot of people theorize that this could have been the lost city of Atlantis because it talks about it being swallowed up by the sea. And so what a lot of historians believe is that this city was a huge part of the Minoan culture. It was a major metropolitan center, and it also housed their largest harbor. Now, I've talked a lot before about the importance of trade. And another thing that I may not have mentioned was that they had an incredible navy. You'll notice when we look at these palaces, there are no walls to keep out invaders. And these people relied a lot on their ships and their navy to be able to defend them from invaders. Now, what a lot of historians believe is that a large amount of their navy was at the city that we see depicted here. We see large story buildings, we see boats, and what it's assumed is that there was a very large port there. And when this volcano erupted, it destroyed not only the city, but all of their ships. Now, in addition to the explosion of the volcano, the massive force of this entire city being swallowed by the ocean and this massive volcanic activity, it sent out a massive tsunami. We're talking huge waves that essentially went to Crete and wiped everything out. Now, it probably didn't take out the entire palace of Knossos, but it is very likely that any ships that they had in the harbors on Crete were also destroyed by the tsunami and the massive waves that followed the volcanic eruption. So now we have this society that was so dependent on their ships for trade, for defense, for food, for fishing, that now has no boats. So that means that they can't trade to get more goods that they need. They can't defend themselves. And they can't go anywhere. They can't even go out and fish for food. So this has leave, left them in an extremely weakened state. They're extremely weak at this point. And their neighbors, the Mycenaeans, were not necessarily known to be an extremely peaceful people. And what most historians believe is that the Mycenaeans noticed how weakened they were by these horrible chains of events that they found their perfect opportunity to invade the Minoans. So what it's thought is that the Mycenaeans came down from mainland Greece and invaded and conquered the Minoan culture. In fact, we see a lot of Mycenaean artwork that looks very similar to a lot of the Minoan artwork. And a lot of historians actually believe that it was Minoan craftspeople who were creating this Mycenaean work, either hired as craftspeople in the new civilization or quite likely working as slaves. So that's all I have for you today. If you want to check out some of my sources on YouTube, um, Evoy's AP Art History Lecture on Minoan Art was extremely helpful to me. The History of Minoan Crete from AncientGreece.org was helpful, and I also relied on the Ancient History Encyclopedia. Good luck. Please feel free.
free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you want to have a conversation about the ancient Minoans, I would love to. Thank you for joining. Um, see you later.